Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. And I wanted to thank uh, Asper in particular. Um, I've really enjoyed the whole stay here. And uh, in particular, the, the lunch yesterday with the students was really a lot of fun, and I really did enjoy it. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, is some new and unpublished data on uh, immunopet uh, imaging study that uh, we did. But before I do that, I want to go through a little bit of background on acute HIV and SIV infection. I think you've heard some of this from some of the other speakers, uh, but I think just to make sure everyone uh, is all uh, together on this, I I'd like to just spend a little bit of time on some background. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, start with that background information on mucosal transmission and acute infection. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, a transmission study that we carried out in rhesus macaques in which we were looking at some of the basic mechanisms about the way that uh, HIV and SIV actually, uh, the way people are mucosally infected. Uh, and then finally, uh, some new data that I think, uh, I hope you'll find interesting. Uh, and this is actually, we're able to visualize virus in live subjects. So rather than uh, waiting for uh, autopsy or biopsy, uh, we can actually see the virus in an animal and perhaps on, uh, in the near future in a human uh, uh, in a very uh, novel way. Uh, so starting with the uh, background. So let me just get out here so I can see the slide. Okay, so, um, so uh, as I'm sure uh, most of you know, HIV and SIV are what we refer to as gut tropic viruses. That means they, they like to replicate in the gut. Um, so the GI tract or the gut is preferentially targeted during the first weeks of both HIV and SIV infections. And this is true whether or not, you, no matter how you're infected, whether it's vaginally or through IV drug use, really the first place you find very high levels of virus is in your, is in, uh, your gut tissue, in your GI tract. And I'll show you some of the very initial observations in just a second. Um, uh, now, the, one of the reasons for that all along has been that uh, the people have thought about is, is that in fact, in, your, in the human immune system, the majority of CD4 positive T cells are actually found in the lymphoid, lymphoid tissue of the gut. It's really a, 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 a quite a pronounced bias. Um, and what we know is, is that uh, these CD4 cells, uh, during this acute phase, during these first weeks, 10, 10 days or weeks, uh, in both HIV and SIV, uh, those CD4 cells are severely depleted. They're really wiped out. Um, um, and then finally, uh, and this is some of the work, I think Dr. Duick has done some of the really important work in this area, that in addition to the destruction of the CD4 T cells in the gut, uh, in addition to the destruction of the CD4 T cells, the structure of the gut is damaged in a very uh, significant way. And that damage just to the structure of the gut uh, leads to chronic immune activation and the fibrosis of gut tissue. And many aspects of, of, of AIDS actually uh, relate uh, to these problems here in addition to the destruction of the CD4 positive T cells. So I'm going to show you some of the early work just to acknowledge the people who actually did this. Uh, this is one of the first studies done by Ron Vesey. There were some other groups that uh, did around the same time uh, very nice work as well. And this was done in uh, an SIV uh, macaque model. What I'm showing you here is basically uh, CD4 positive T cells, the frequency of CD4 positive T cells in the gut and in, the per and in a, peripheral, a peripheral lymph node, either before infection or w in the week or weeks after infection. And what you see is that in this, in, in this animal, about 30% of the CD4 cells in the gut uh, are CD4 positive. 30% of the, the T cells are CD4 positive. Um, and in the peripheral, it's known it's a little bit higher. Um, however, three weeks after infection, what you see is that in the, in, in, the, in the jejunum, in the gut, those cells are really wiped. They're, they're gone now. You've gone from 30 down to 5%. Whereas that, the frequency in, in, the, in the peripheral lymph node really hasn't changed too much. And so this is, I think, just a, one example of the way in which uh, we think about um, uh, both HIV and SIV as a gut tropic virus. So this was uh, initially done in SIV, as you can uh, well imagine, uh, and this was followed up uh, by work uh, uh, in HIV, and this was work done by um, uh, 
uh, Sara Mahandru and Marty Markowitz at the Aaron Diamond Research Center. And they're uh, sort of looking at the, in the same way. They're looking in the blood uh, and, in the, in, and in gut tissues uh, in acutely infected patients. And what they see is if they just take an average of, of, of cells, of CD4 cells, uh, there is a loss of CD4 cells in acute infection within the first months uh, in the blood. But in the gut tissues, there's a much more dramatic loss. And so this led to the concept, not just for SIV, but for HIV as well, that it is very much uh, a, 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 a gut infection. Okay, uh, uh, Sarab uh, then went on and showed that, um, in fact, uh, the, those gut CD4 cells uh, uh, harbor uh, much uh, significantly higher levels of, of viral DNA. So if you're looking at these patients, these are all patients within the first three months of infection, what you're seeing is, is that the amount of proviral DNA here on the y-axis, I'm, I'm excuse, excuse me, this is, uh, yeah, the, the amount of proviral DNA in CD4 positive T cells, that there are higher levels in the gut tissue uh, than in the peripheral blood. And that makes sense given that that's where the virus is replicating. Uh, this is a little bit of a busy slide. I won't really go through all of it, but one of the things that's been recognized since the advent of, of effective antiretroviral therapy is that that loss of CD4 positive T cells that I showed you that, it herp that happens within the first few weeks, you really can't recover from that uh, by treating people. You can put people on ART very, very early and keep them on ART for many, many years, but you never really recover your CD4 positive T cell compartment entirely. And this is a, a significant question, and the, the basis for this is something that we really still don't understand. Uh, but I think that uh, in, in the coming years, there may be some, we may have some important things to say about this. Okay, so just a, this is the, that was the background, and just to summarize, the GI tract is preferentially targeted during the acute and early HIV and SIV infection. Uh, and the gut is damaged, and it seems that that may be permanent. At least we don't yet know how uh, to repair it in its entirety. Uh, and long-term antiretroviral, long antiretroviral therapy does not allow the mucosal CD4 T cell reconstitution in the majority of patients that have been studied. Okay, so the question that we uh, started to ask a number of years ago is why is it that HIV and SIV target the gut in the very early stages of infection. So it really doesn't matter how you're infected, uh, by which route, even uh, in the context of IV drug use, the gut is the place where the virus initially homes to and replicates. So why is that? Um, and then the second question we ask, is there any way to prevent the virus from infecting, the, infecting these gut CD4 positive T cells? Is there any way that we can prevent this damage to the gut structure? Because it's this, it's this destruction of the gut CD4 T cells and the damage to the gut. Those are really the underlying basis of HIV disease. So I think that these are highly relevant questions. Okay, so what I need to do now is talk to you about how is it that a CD4 positive T cell goes from, say, the vaginal mucosa or from the blood into the gut lymphoid tissue. And the answer is that it uses a, a, a series of homing receptors. And, and prominent among those homing receptors are a class of proteins called integrins. So there are um, integrins or receptors that are expressed on the surface of, of cells, including lymphocytes. And they direct the, the homing, of the location of, of cells to specific tissues. So there's 24 integrins all together. They all have different functions. Um, but each function, each integrin has both an alpha chain and a beta chain. And you can see here are the different integrins and different combinations of alpha and beta chains pair up to form the 24 integrins. But we're interested in one integrin in particular. Um, uh, it's an integrin uh, given the name uh, alpha 4 beta 7. And the reason we're interested in this integrin is because its job, among its jobs, is to mediate the trafficking or the homing of CD4 positive T cells in the gut where HIV and SIV replicate. Okay, so how does it do that? So MADCAM, it's an unusual name. MADCAM is a very important receptor that uh, you need to understand. So MADCAM is expressed 
on the surface of endothelial cells. This is the membrane of an endothelial cell that lines uh, the gut tissue that services the lamina propria and the pyrus patches of the gut. And you'll see that MADCAM is expressed on these endothelial cells. And this is one of the few places in the body that MADCAM is expressed. And that's important because MADCAM is the specific ligand for alpha-4, beta-7. So what happens is, if a CD4-positive T cell happens to express alpha-4, beta-7, as it's traveling through uh, the venules, uh, through the gut, if it sees MADCAM, it's going to stop and enter the gut. So that's the way that a CD4-positive T cell or a CD8-positive T cell or a B cell or even an NK cell, that's how they get into the gut tissues, is, is through this interaction between MADCAM and alpha-4, beta-7. Okay, so there have been a number of studies, most of them in SIV, but more recently in HIV, that show that when you look at the CD4-positive T cells in the very, very early days and weeks of infection, that the very first cells that become infected are CD4-positive T cells that express high levels of alpha-4, beta-7. So this was actually, if you go all the way back to 2001, uh, this is the very first paper I could ever find that actually showed this. But since then, you can see, uh, in, in particular, in the SIV model, that people of all a number of different groups have shown uh, that the, the alpha-4, beta-7 positive T cells are the first cells infected and the first cells that disappear. Uh, a month or so ago, I saw some work from a, a group in, in Bangkok who show that the alpha-4, beta-7, CD4 positive T cells probably start to disappear within the first five or six days of infection. They are truly the first cells uh, infected and targeted. So um, why is it that the virus likes these cells so much? Well, one of the things that we know is that the alpha-4, beta-7, CD4 positive T cells are highly activated. So of course, HIV is a retrovirus. It needs uh, activation. It needs the, uh, a cell to be metabolically activated in order for it to, to replicate. So what I'm showing you here is uh, a profile of some purified CD4 positive T cells. So these are all CD4 positive T cells, but we're looking at the expression of alpha-4, beta-7 on the y-axis, and here on the x-axis is CD45RO, a marker of, of T cell memory. So you can see that the cells that express a lot of alpha-4, beta-7 are the memory cells, are, mem are primarily memory cells. If you look at the expression of CCR5, the HIV co-receptor, you can see that it is expressed primarily on those cells that express high levels of beta-7. And very importantly, this is KI67. This is a, a, a marker of, of metabolic activity. And if you look, the, the cells that are most activated, or really the, all of the cells that are activated, are the cells that express high levels of alpha-4, beta-7. This is true both in the peripheral blood, but this is also true in the genital compartment, and I'll show you that in a moment, right? So when we first started to look at this, we thought, well, you know, this may uh, go a long way toward explaining why it is that alpha-4, beta-7 positive CD4 cells, alpha-4, beta-7 high CD4 cells, are the first cells infected. So this is a, a paper from one of our colleagues, uh, and this was done in Nairobi, uh, Rupert Cowell and Lyle McKinnon. And they're, what they're doing is, is they're taking uh, cervical uh, cytobrush samples. So they're looking at the cells uh, uh, that are uh, highly relevant uh, to vaginal transmission, and they're looking and they're phenotyping them. And the first thing I'll show you, point out, is, is that whereas if you look in the blood, really only about, on average, these are different individual patients, if we're looking at the percentage of CD4 positive cells that express alpha 4, beta 7 high levels, it's really only around 10%. But when you look in these cervical uh, cytobrush samples, most of the cells express high levels of alpha-4, beta-7. So those cells uh, tend to be activated. This is CD69, a marker of cellular activation that Lyle was using. And if you look at the expression of CCR5, there's a nice uh, uh, correlation between high levels of alpha-4, beta-7 and high levels of CCR5. 
So if you read this paper, what they say is, you know, if you look at an alpha-4, beta-7, CD4 positive T cell, it's the perfect cell to, to, to become infected. Um, and in fact, you can show that in vitro. This is an experiment that we did in which we uh, took uh, uh, CD4 positive T cells, and you can see this is the expression of alpha-4, beta-7 on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we're looking at uh, 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 HIV infection by staining with intracellular P24. And if you look, the majority of cells, this is, I think, uh, uh, three days post-infection, the majority of cells that are infected uh, are those cells that express high levels of alpha-4, beta-7. Now, if you wait, if you wait out, if you go out to, three day, to 10 days or 14 days, these other cells will become infected. But these cells seem to be the ones that the virus prefers. Okay. So a number of years ago, uh, we uh, were looking at uh, the interaction of the HIV GP120 with surface receptors. And what we found was, was that some GP120s actually combine to alpha-4, beta-7. It's a, it's a modestly high affinity interaction. Um, um, and this was a little bit uh, confusing to us because alpha-4, beta-7, it's not a, really an entry receptor. That is, you don't need this receptor <coughs> excuse me, to infect a cell. Um, and the other thing that we noticed was, was that not all the recombinant GP120s that we were looking at did bind alpha-4 or beta-7, only a subset. So there was this specific interaction. The other thing that we noticed that I thought that was quite interesting was, was that you looked on the surface of a CD4 positive T cell. This receptor was in close association with the CD4 receptor. Um, in fact, you can actually measure a specific affinity between these two receptors. Now, I, I noticed, the, uh, put the, uh, the sizes of these receptors off, uh, uh, in here because I wanted to just to point out that alpha-4, beta-7 is a very, very prominent receptor on the surface of a cell. It, it really sort of, it sort of sticks out. And so this, this, you know, in our very simple-minded way, we started to think about what this was. It was a receptor that wasn't required uh, but seemed to be expressed on the surface of cells that were activated. So, just to summarize what I've told you here, is the integrin alpha-4 beta-7 is a, is a, it's a gut homo receptor, and HIV is a, a infection is very much gut tropic. Alpha-4 beta-7 high CD4 positive T cells uh, tend to be activated in, ma in many cases, um, and these, this subset of cells are targeted in acute infection. Uh, and then finally, some envelope proteins but not all seem, uh, are able to bind to integrin alpha-4, beta-7. Okay, so try, in trying to put this story all together, one of the things that w I, I think it's important to keep in mind is that sexual transmission of HIV, at least mucosal transmission, is a relatively inefficient uh, uh, event. This is a study from Tom Quinn in our lab. He's looking at uh, discordant couples in, in the Rakai district of, of Uganda. And what he's showing is, in fact, that in most cases in these discordant couples, that is where, where one partner is infected and the other not, that it really, re it really takes multiple uh, uh, coital acts in order for transmission to occur. And what this means is, uh, what this means, I think, is, is that what's happening is people are exposed multiple times, in all likelihood, before the infection actually takes. So, with that in mind, what we're thinking is, is that what seems to be required is, is that the virus, if it interacts with one of these cells that expresses alpha-4, beta-7, its chances of establishing an infection are greater, primarily because these cells tend to be activated. If, if a virus encounters a CD4-positive T cell that's not activated, in all likelihood, it can bind to and fuse and enter that cell, but it's not going to go very far because the cell is not itself dividing or proliferating. Okay, so how do we test that? It's not an easy, it's not an easy uh, uh, idea to test because this receptor isn't really required for viral replication in vitro. So we decided to look in an animal model. And the question that we're asking is, if we target this these cells, can we decrease the efficiency of mucosal transmission? 
To do this, we used an antibody specific for alpha-4, beta-7. It was an antibody that was developed, discovered in the, in the 1990s. It's a very unique antibody. There's, n there's nothing quite, there's, no one's ever been able to make one uh, like it again, although they've tried very hard. Um, it's called ACT-1. Uh, and our colleagues, uh, Tab and Sari, had taken this antibody, it's a mouse antibody, and primatized it. That is, he had replaced the mouse heavy chains with, with, with macaque heavy chains. Other people have taken this antibody and humanized it. And the reason they've humanized it is to treat uh, Crohn's disease, an inflammatory bowel disease. And in fact, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in any case, the basis is this mouse antibody that can be either primatized or humanized. So the question that we decided to ask was, will this antibody, this anti-alpha-4 beta-7 antibody, protect uh, macaques from transmission? And the type of transmission that we were looking at was what we call low-dose vag vaginal challenge. And what this is, is we try to, in some very crude way, recapitulate, that is, replicate the type of transmission that a human w w would encounter. Um, and the way we do that is that we expose animals to very small amounts of virus, but repeatedly. So once a week, we would, we would expose animals to a low enough amount of virus that they wouldn't immediately become infected, but eventually they should, they should become infected. And that's because we wanted to recreate, I told you that tr sexual transmission is inefficient, and so we wanted to sort of at least get some little bit of that inefficiency built into our transmission model. Okay, so this is the scheme of what we did. We take monkeys that are treated either with an alpha-4, beta-7 antibody or a control antibody, and they were given that antibody on day minus three. And then once a week, the animals were challenged with an SIV virus. These numbers uh, are each of the different weeks, and every single week the animals were given a blood test to see if they had become infected. The antibody was given at day minus three, on week three, week six, and week 12. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you what happens. Okay, so uh, just to remind, they start with the antibody already infused. The antibody is given intravenously. So here's what we saw. If we go through the first five challenges, these are the control animals that received IgG, 10 out of the 12 control animals that we tested became infected within those first five challenges. Whereas only one out of the alpha-4, beta-7 treated animals became infected. So we were seeing uh, a significant effect. At this point, we were, we were, I think, getting a little excited. So then what we found was, um, as time went on, that these animals were, of course, were infected. At 10 out of 12, two remained uh, uninfected. We, we stopped after five challenges. Six out of these 12 animals never got infected. Six did become infected. And what I'm gonna talk to you about now is what happens to those six animals that did become infected. But before I do that, I just wanna make one point, that 10 out of the 12 control animals became viremic by week five, and the challenges were therefore discontinued with two control animals remaining unaffected. In contrast, only one out of the 12 anti-alpha-4 beta-7 treated animals had become viremic by the fifth week, and an additional five developed viremia by week eight. Six out of 12 remained uninfected. So this is the Kaplan-Meier, and what you see is that there was both significant protection and a pronounced delay in viremia. Okay, so we wanted to look at what happened in the gut of those animals, in the gut lymphoid tissue. Now you can't look at the gut during the initial challenges because that's, you, would, you, would, you would cause bleeding and that would, that would uh, interfere with the experiment. But starting at week eight, when the challenges were stopped, then we could start to look. And so we did that. And what you see is, now remember, these animals, I showed you in the previous, let me go back. These animals, um, are all, they all have significant plasma viremia. But when you look in their gut, what you see is th there's no virus. 
or I, very little proviral DNA, I should say. This is proviral DNA on the y-axis, and this is weeks after challenge. And that's in distinct contrast to the control animals where proviral DNA is easily measured. I don't have it on this slide, but what's interesting is long after the therapy has ceased, if you go out to week 50, you'll still see this effect. The antibody's long gone, but if you keep the virus out of the gut during acute infection, it never seems to establish infection in the gut. This is something we really don't understand, but I think it's something that's very, very interesting. Okay, so you heard uh, Dr. Hope gave a very nice talk a few days ago, and he talked about delays in infection, and, and I showed you that here. We, show, we showed delays in infection. This is just an example of one of those animals, sort of an extreme example, where you see the last challenge is here at week five, and you don't get any virus in this animal's blood until week eight. And so we're seeing what's happening to this virus. How is it that the virus, where is it for those three weeks? Well, one of the things that we noticed was in the animals that were treated with anti-alpha-4, page 7, but did get infected, when we went out at week 16, 17, later on, when we did, we did cervical biopsies and we looked for proviral DNA, and that's what I'm showing you here. If you look in the control animals, that is the animals that got the IgG, you don't find any virus in the cervical tissue, right? The virus probably was, 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 was uh, deposited in, in the vaginal tissue and then left, went into the circulation, went into the draining lymph nodes, established infection. But what you find is in these animals that were treated with the anti-alpha-4 beta-7, weeks later, you could actually find proviral DNA still in uh, these cervical tissues. Now, I don't know if this is replication-confident virus, but what I think this does tell us is that in some way, these CD4-positive T cells that are taking up virus are in some way getting sort of stuck in the cervical tissue. So it's an interesting question. We would love to know what these cells are, but that's sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack. Okay, so how did this... Oops, let me go back. So how did the treatment affect the CD4-positive T cells particularly in the blood. So just to show you, this was, this was in the blood. You can see that there is some diminution in those six animals that did become infected in viral load, but not a significant difference. However, when we looked at CD4 positive T cells, what we saw was pretty interesting. If you look now, so what I'm going to show you here is, uh, let me start with the total CD4 positive T cells in the blood. This is just uh, some uninfected control animals that we had, and, and this is what you typically see for total CD4 cells. These are the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 treated animals. They're somewhat lower, but not a great deal lower. These are the IgG treated animals, the ones that got infected. And so you can see that there's a dramatic reduction in CD4 cells here, but not so much here. That's particularly true in the memory cell compartments. That is, what we see is that the treatment with the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 minimized, even though there's a lot of virus in, these, in the blood, it, the antibody minimized the loss of CD4 positive T cells as it's reflected in the blood. Okay, so if you remember, I started off by asking the question, can the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 antibody prevent transmission? The answer is yes, it can. So we had this idea that, you know, in trying to understand why is it that HIV is a gut tropic virus, I think one of the really very simple, there's nothing very complicated about this, one of the very simple explanations for that, and I'm sure there's more than one, is that the reason it's a gut tropic virus is because it infects cells that are going to home to the gut, right? Makes sense. And so that's what we're showing here, is that alpha-4, beta-7 high cells tend to be activated, they express lots of CCR5, and the virus likes to replicate in these cells. So that's why we think the virus is homing to the gut, regardless of the route of infection. Okay, but how does this antibody work? There are four possibilities that we listed. One is that perhaps the antibody is interfering just with the interaction between the virus and the cell. Perhaps it's interfering with cell trafficking. Maybe it's interfering with cell-to-cell -cell spread. And finally, the mechanism that I favor is that it's interfering with signaling. 
Now, I won't talk about these too much today, but I will tell you that we don't really know the answer. Okay, but we want to know the answer. And so what we've done uh, more recently, and this is unpublished data, is we've turned to a technique called positron emission tomography, computer tomography, positron attrition tomography, computed tomography, or PET-CT. So this is something I'm sure in the hospital down the street uh, that you have probably a few of these PET scanners, and this is something that's routinely used in, in medicine. And this is, these are the sorts of images that you get. And we wanted to apply this and look at the virus in SIV-infected macaques. So this is what we do. This is done uh, down at the Emory University in their PET-CT scanner. This is actually the one in the hospital. So the, these are SIV-infected animals, and so you can imagine people don't want to see an animal sitting next to them in the waiting room. So we have to do this late at night when there's no patients around. And it's actually, it's a very, logistically, it's a very, um, it's not an easy thing to arrange. The, the radiologists are not all that anxious to have monkeys in their PET-CT scanner. Um, and so what we did was we used a kind of PET-CT that's immunopet. That is, we, the probes that we used were radio-labeled probes against the GP120 protein of SIV. It's a monoclonal antibody against the V2 loop of SIV. And we also imaged for the CD4 po positive cells that with an anti-CD4 antibody. So, oh, let me just back up. I want to make one point, is that by using this probe, this anti-GP120 probe, what we're looking at is probably we're looking at envelope on the surface of infected cells, but also envelope that's trapped, perhaps, maybe on dendritic cells or other cells. So we can't really say that we're looking at infected cells, but I hope that at least some of the cells that we're looking at are infected. And then, of course, uh, uh, we want to look at the CD4 positive cells because those are the cells that the virus infects. So this is just an example of one of the images that I'm going to show you just to orient you. And this is from the CT scanning, and the uh, radiologists can identify for us the small bowel, the descending colon, the transverse colon, also the uh, various lymph nodes, in inguinal lymph nodes, uh, and uh, spleen, so on. And I, I have to be honest, I, I rely on his help in interpreting these images because I think it really does require a degree of expertise. Okay. So the, the, this, the initial study was carried out uh, by our colleague Francois Villinger and Phil San Angelo. And this was the, really the initial uh, description of this technology. And what you're looking at here is this is an SIV-infected macaque. You can see here his head, his GI tract, and the testis. And this is this animal infected with SIV MAC239, imaged with an anti-GP120 antibody. And this is this a chronically infected animal uh, before given uh, antiretroviral therapy, and then after retroviral therapy. And you'll notice that here's the signal in the GI tract, and it's greatly reduced. Here in the uh, nasal lymphoid tissue, you also see signal, and this is one of the things that they became very interested in. They see signal uh, in the nasal lymphoid tissue very early after infection, and even in the acute phases of infection. Um, and although that signal is diminished, you can still see signal even during antiretroviral therapy. And I would encourage you to read the paper if you want to follow up on that. It's, I think it's a very interesting subject. They also see in the testis. Okay, so just some, some nomenclature here. Um, uh, what what uh, the radiologist will do for us is he will, he will circle an organ or tissue of interest. They will define, this is the volume of interest. They will then define parameters like the SUV max, which is the brightest spot within that, uh, within that uh, volume or the SUV mean, which is the average uh, brightness within that, within that volume. And then I'll show you uh, uh, that can be depicted uh, um, by a bar graph, showing either the SUV max or the SUV mean. And here we're doing that for different, for different spleen, inguinal lymph node, and axillary lymph node. Okay, so what we did was we had, what we were doing was, we had animals that were being infected for various other studies. And whenever we had a chance and the PET-CT scanner was open, we would image them. So it wasn't that we had a, a defined study just for imaging, but we were opportunistic. Whenever we could image, we did. So there were two cohorts that we used. The first was those animals that were used in the low-dose vaginal challenge study that I just described for you. And these were animals that were infected with SIV-MAC251. The second group of animals that were treated 
These were animals that were given either high-dose intravenous or interrectal challenge with SIV MAC239. So let me just show you how this was done. So this is cohort one. So these were animals that were imaged during acute phase of infection. So what I'm showing you here is these are the weeks of, uh, of the experiment. The animals were given the antibody on day minus three and then on week three. So they were only given two doses of the antibody. And then here they were imaged. They were imaged at the very beginning of the experiment, and then on weeks two and three and five. Two and three for virus and week five for CD4. So the key here is, is that what we're trying to ask is, we're trying to compare animals that were treated with this antibody versus antibody, animals that were treated with this antibody. So that was for acute infection. For chronic infection, we took animals, it was from our low-dose challenge study, so these were, again, animals that were given antibody at day minus three, they were then challenged, and remember, six of those animals became infected, and those six animals that became infected, we imaged them for virus, way out here at week 16, 17, and we call those early chronic. They were also imaged for CD4 way out here at week 46. Okay, so now let me just show you what we saw. Uh, and here we are looking at um, uh, acute infection, so weeks two and three. And I'm looking in particular at the GI tract. So in the animal that was treated with IgG, you see very bright signals in the GI tract, whereas in the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 animal, you see uh, in both the small bowel and the colon significant reductions in the signal. And I mean, this is an example, but we did uh, basically all of the animals in the study. And what we saw was uh, at both weeks two and week three as best we could. And what you see is, you see in the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 animals, on average, you see a significant reduction in the signal in the colon and the small bowel. You also see, and this was one of the big surprises, is that we also saw reductions in other tissues, in the lung and then in the spleen and then in these, these lymph nodes. So even though the big effect that we were expecting to see was in the GI tract, what we were seeing was reductions in, very, in many other tissues. Some of these tissues, I think you can understand, other mucosal tissues, there's a connection between various mucosal tissues, the tissues, uh, nasal tissues, lung tissues, and mucosal tissues. Um, uh, and that's reflected, but also in some of these other lymph nodes, and we really, this is things that we really weren't expecting to see, but we did see. So that's one of the, one of the sort of surprises. Um, the other thing that we noticed was that in looking specifically in the gut, so these are, uh, now I'm showing you just cross sections from those uh, similar animals, and what we saw was, was that the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 antibody reduced the virus in the colon to a greater extent in the small bowel. So that makes sense because the colon is where the effector sites of the gut are. That's where all the memory cells are. There's also uh, uh, effector sites in the small bowel, but there there's also the inductive sites, the pyrus, past, pyrus patches and so on. And so what we're seeing here is this uh, uh, pronounced effect where you're actually reducing virus more in uh, the effector sites. And we think that's kind of interesting. Okay, so now let's go on to chronic infection and looking at virus in the chronic infection. And what I'm showing you here is these are matched. This is a, a pair of animals with high viral loads and a pair of animals with low viral loads. And it really doesn't matter if it's a high viral load or a low viral load. What you see is, uh, in both instances, you see that the antibody, the anti 4 beta 7 antibody, <coughs> is able to uh, reduce in a significant way uh, uh, the signal that is the virus, the proviral, the, the the GP120, I should say, in the colon and in the small bowel, and that's reflected here. Okay. All right, so that's the virus. We're seeing reductions of virus in, 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 in the gut, but in a specific way. Now what happens to the CD4 cells? <coughs> so we're using an anti-CD4 antibody. Um, it's also been primatized uh, and, and, and digested to FAB. <coughs> so here we go. So here, here, here is an uninfected animal, and you're looking here at the GI tract, and you can see very bright signals. So these are the CD4 cells. If you look at an infected animal in that same region, so this is a chronically infected animal uh, treated with IgG, and you see a great diminution. So this is an, an acutely infected animal. You see um, also in an anti-alpha-4 beta-7 animal, what we saw there was we also saw uh, a, a, dip, a diminution in signal 
This is just sort of an isotype control. So when we plotted that out graphically, what we saw was something that we really weren't expecting to see. If you look at the difference between an uninfected animal and a chronically infected animal, you see a big depletion in CD4 positive T cells in the IgG. But when you look at the alpha-4, beta-7 treated animals between the IgG and the alpha-4, there's not much difference. So the anti-alpha-4, beta-7 isn't really protecting the CD4 positive T cells in your gut during acute infection. It is protecting them in the chronic infection to a degree. Not completely, but to a degree. So that's shown here, I think, a little bit better. If you look at the alpha-4, beta-7 treated animal and an IgG control treated animal in chronic infection, what you're seeing is you're seeing a preservation of the CD4 positive T cells. And that's shown here. That is, is that you're not losing all of the CD4 positive T cells. This was something we really weren't following. That is, that we're seeing loss. The alpha-4, beta-7 is not protecting the animal's CD4 cells early, but it is protecting them later on. So we decided to look at bio we decided to look we decided to take biopsies and look at them that way. And we found pretty much the same thing. Here you're seeing the percentage of CD4 positive T cells in these colon biopsies. And these are just uninfected animals, so this is our sort of our baseline. If you look at acute infection, what you see is there's a reduction in both the alpha-4 beta-7 and in the IgG treated animals, about the same. If you look at early chronic, now so later on, at weeks 15, there's still a loss, but it's not nearly as dramatic as the IgG. So this loss that is occurring in the untreated animals see, appears to be arrested. And if you look way out, after week 45, that's maintained. So even though the antibody's gone, you seem to have preserved your CD4 positive T cells in some way. Now, we don't know the mechanism of that, but we think it's something we want to pursue. So what happens to the CD4 positive T cells in an uninfected animal treated with anti-alpha-4 beta-7? After all, it's possible that all of the effects that we're seeing is just that we're, the antibody is just removing all the CD4 cells from the, from the gut, and that's why we're not getting transmission, the, the whole thing. It's just there's no CD4 positive T cells. So I'm going to show you that's not true. So these are just some animals. Uh, these are four animals. Uh, that we image for CD4, they're not infected. We're just imaging them for CD4 just to show you the variation in the CD4 signal in four different animals. And there's not too much variation in, in these various tissues. If we take these four animals and we treat them with alpha-4, beta-7, what happens? So here's what happens. So here is the GI tract, the spleen, the null, the axillary and inguinal lymph nodes, before treatment and after treatment. The CD4 signal doesn't change. So the treatment with the antibody is not just evacuating your CD4 positive T cells from these tissues. It may be changing which CD4 cells are in those tissues, but it's not leading to a gross depletion of those CD4 positive T cells, or CD4 T cells. Okay, we wanted to validate all this, and we did that with, uh, by doing a, a PCR for virus. So we're looking at a virus by PCR and by imaging. And there's a pretty good correlation that is and here on the y-axis is copies of DNA by PCR, and here's the SUV max by, uh, by imaging. And you can see when the virus is low uh, uh, by imaging, it also tends to be low by uh, uh, PCR. And there's also a, sort of a, a nice sort of inverse correlation with CD4. So we think this tends to validate uh, the assay, and then I think we're on the right track. Okay, so I want to just con conclude then is that the, in, oh, this didn't come through. So the intravenous administration to the rhesus macaques of this primatized antibody directing against alpha-4, beta-7 reduces the efficiency of vaginal transmission. These alpha-4, beta-7, CD4 T cells that reside in or trapped to the gut lymphoid tissue play a key role in SIV transmission, and we think that's probably the case for HIV as well. In macaques that do become infected in, in the presence of the anti-alpha-4 beta-7 antibody, the gut tissue is protected in a significant way. From the imaging studies, what we see is that in acute infection, anti-alpha-4 beta-7 treatment inhibits virus replication overall and clearly within both the small and large intestines. And the antibody mediates both the preservation of... C is mediate preservation is not apparent in the gut tissues during this acute phase.
However, in the chronic phase, what we see is there is this pronounced decrease in viral replication in the GI tract. The treatment is greater in the colon than a small bowel, this effect. And there is, seems to be a preservation of CD4 T cells. We don't see uh, uh, that in unaffected animals that it does not seem to deplete the CD4 positive T cells. So the mechanism, despite the presence of abundant CD4 positive T cells in the GI tract in these infected animals, the alpha-4, beta-7 treatment reduces viral replication. So I'll just finish with this. You heard Dr. Graham the other day talk about the development of the VRCO1 antibody as a, as a preventative measure. And, and it's really an enormous undertaking. Here we have a drug, vetalizumab. It's actually in the clinic. You can probably go down the street, it's in the pharmacy. It's being treated, it's uh, only in 2013 that it was approved. Uh, and it's actually uh, uh, reasonably effective in the treatment of, of some difficult to treat cases of Crohn's disease, which is a good thing for people with Crohn's. And so we think that it's very interesting that, that we have, uh, or fortuitous, that we have access to such a drug right now. And we're going to use that drug to try to understand more, as much as we can, about the early stages of infection. So with that, I'll just acknowledge um, uh, uh, our collaborators, in particular, uh, Tab Ansari and Francois Villager uh, and Phil San Angelo uh, down at Emory and Yerkes. Um, uh, and then finally, I just, um, um, let's see, it's not going to work. Okay, and I think I'll just end there.